Hey, everybody. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the ProdPad Product Expert webinar. This is a series of webinars, and we have a ton of past talks recorded, so you can always go back and watch the other ones. We have a mixture of presentations and firesides, and we always invite amazing product experts from around the world who come and join us and talk about the insights that they've gathered from their experience. And there's always this focus on the content and the learning and the sharing and just making sure that you all have great takeaways from the day. And so it is a chance for us to have a great conversation as well as you all to jump in on the conversation. So make use of the chats, make use of the Q&A, let us know what you, what you think and what kind of questions you have. In the meantime, uh, I am going to introduce you to Joe in a minute, but I am going to talk you through and show you a little bit about ProdPad uh, before we get started. This is a tool that was built by myself and my co-founder. We were both product managers ourselves, and we needed tools to do our own jobs. Essentially, we needed something to help keep track of the experiments we were running to hit our business objectives and to solve customer problems. We were trying to keep tab on all the ideas and feedback that made up of our backlog. And building ProdPad gave us control and organization and transparency. And so it wasn't long before we started sharing it with other product people around us. And today it's used by thousands of teams around the world. So it's free to try. We even have a sandbox mode, which is like a preloaded version of ProdPad that has example product management data. So you can see how things like lean roadmaps and OKRs, experiments, and how everything else fits together in a product management space. And really use it to learn how you might use this to, to help your own product management processes. And our team is made up of product people. So if you ever have any questions, let us know. And of course, let us know your feedback. Enough about myself and what we're working on. I really look forward to introducing you to Joe Leach. So Joe is a friend of mine and a great product person in the scene. I know Joe through the product management circles. He's been working with the Mind the Product, being doing uh, talks and workshops there for uh, quite some time and runs an amazing workshop. I think some of that comes from your background as a, a teacher, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was an elementary primary school teacher for a while. It's always lovely to go back and wear that teacher's hat, especially with product people. <laughs> the, you, yeah. Tra translates really well to guiding a class, guiding a, a room of people. And uh, we were just talking about the fact that the last time Joe and I, uh, jo Joe was actually one of the last people I saw in the real world. We were on the stage together at Mind the Product Engage in Manchester back in February 2020 before everything shut down. And so I'm thinking back to that with a big heart and just really loving that experience. And I uh, really loved Joe's talk. One of the phrases that really stuck out to me was, um, the whole is not the goal. <laughs> <laughs> and he'll probably tell you a little bit more about what that yeah, means. That's... And <laughs> we can have some context to that. <laughs> that's a really interesting one because that was me reacting to the, everybody knows all that cliche of product management of people don't want a quarter inch drill they want a quarter inch hole it's that kind of that quote that's actually came from economics and to me I don't, I don't want a hole I want to put a picture up or I want to put some shelves up a hole is not the goal for me in terms of that thing so that's where the hole is not the goal came from me is that always when I look at what people's requirements are for anything it's never one level deep it's always two or three or four levels deeper the hole is never the goal for me never yeah. That the whole is not the goal. It's not what people actually want to do. And I love how you tied it back to what jobs to be done means to us making a, a better product decision. And so Joe is also the author of Psychology for Designers and worth pointing out that is the author of the upcoming book, Making Better Decisions, which is the topic of the day. This is what we're mostly going to be talking about today. It'd be really great to hear from you, Joe. Let's bring everybody up to speed. You want to tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, yeah. So my background, before I was a teacher, I studied neuroscience. My background is really in psychology. So a big part of my early career was using psychology, really, because I came from a user experience background, I was applying psychology to product and digital design way back when. And that was early days with people like eBay. I helped support and led the relaunch of Train 9 in 2010 in the UK to the UK train ticketing system. Marriott was one of the big ones I worked on in 2014. I had the relaunch for that in 18 languages, 36 countries. So I've done some really serious heavyweight product relaunches in my career for people like Disney as well. It's 
other people like money supermarket and you know most recently I basically what I do these days is I supercharge product managers and teams and leaders so I work with often with CEOs through to CPOs through to senior product folks just to kind of supercharge them and their teams to do good things it's really when my background so via user experience to product to where I am now working with senior leaders in tech Excellent. Very good. And so tell me about this uh, new book that you're reading, this new angle that you're on around making better. This was interesting. So I had this thing where I would talk a lot about people, about decision-making in organizations. And because I had that kind of quite a varied level of background, people always like, how do people make choices and decisions in this world? And actually it started when I, in a period when I was working in an agency, actually, I, over the period of about a year, we worked with two organizations. We worked with Hotels.com and we also worked with another hotels company called uh, Late Rooms, who were very similar. And this was back when the UK, when these two folks were, were competing with each other for hotel bookings in the UK. I remember going one day into Late Rooms now. Oh, Hotels.com have launched this amazing new feature. We should absolutely copy it and take it. We should do this. And I was like, okay, it doesn't seem like a great idea, but let's do it anyway. And about six months later, I was in the, the opposite. I was in hotels.com and they were like, yeah, Late Rooms has done this amazing new feature. We should totally copy what they're doing. And it just opened my eyes to the fact that these organizations were just basically copying each other. And it's like this one-upmanship and nobody was really coming in and transforming that industry. And so many years later, I got the opportunity to work with booking.com, who dominate really now in, in the hotel booking space. And what was interesting about them is they don't focus on the competition. They've got an eye on the competition, but the competition isn't their primary focus. And that for me was really interesting is it was, I'd always suspected that because everything they did was based around customers and their needs. And so that started on this journey of understanding how do organizations make decisions and choices. And so I started with booking.com when I was working with them and I interviewed one of the product directors there, one of the lead product directors for that rental car operation actually here in the UK. I interviewed him and we put that as a podcast and it was really fascinating to me. I thought, I'm going to do more of this. So I, again, having worked on the internet for so many flipping years now, I had a good black book of people I could call up and, in, and talk to. And so since then, I, on the podcast, I've spoken to folks from WordPress, from YouTube, from Instagram, from The Knot, which is a huge wedding website, just loads of really interesting, smart leaders within tech and product. And I just interviewed them and asked them, how do you make decisions there? Tell me, how's this done? What is your secret source of this? And because I just wanted to know, it was just really fascinating for me and everybody else wants to know. So I started with the podcast. The podcast really was a place to start. And so what I'm doing now is taking that podcast and distilling that into a book. And we'll talk about that today, some practical tips really for you to, you lot to make better choices in the world that you're in and how you can support your business, your team and whoever in making better decisions in, in the business. Excellent. I love that. I love how the podcast is basically like an MVP of the book, like a way to test the premise. I wish I'd planned out to do that. Yeah, that was the case. But, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Books do feel like, honestly, like you're shipping an enormous product and it's like one big launch. It's one big waterfall project and it's, it's scary, really. So I've been blogging lots about it in sprints, but yeah, writing a book. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. That's a different thing for the day, but yeah, definitely the podcast has been the MVP of that. Yeah. And you're talking about those uh, different hotel travel companies that were copying the competitors. And it's really interesting that dynamic where they were saying they're doing this, we have to do that. And you as the, the product person on the team, you end up feeling like you just have to do it because somebody on the team comes up with this prerogative to do it. And I remember being in those positions as well, where I just assumed that somebody higher up in the business had some knowledge that this is the right thing to do. And so you go along with it. And in hindsight, you look at that going, I should have called the yet on that. <laughs> Where did that come you from? You do, your competitors got an insight that you haven't got. Yeah. What was interesting about going to the two of them is neither of them had that insight. Neither of them had that ability to experiment, to get really to the heart of what the user wanted, like booking do. They didn't have that. So they were just always one-upping each other. And it was like an arms race between them, which is, don't get me wrong, it's a great way to succeed in certain industries, but it doesn't allow you to leapfrog and to really push and forge ahead like Booking did. They totally dominate now because of that absolute focus on user need and experimentation to get them there. It's fascinating being in that world, really. Here's a question. Going back, what would you have done different if you were working at, was it late rooms that you were at and they were the ones? Yeah, the late rooms had gone, they, they, were the, they were big in the UK and they were big in Asia as well. And they'd gone, they'd gone kaput. They were, yeah. the, their, their domain was sold for like 40,000 pounds recently. They were multi hundreds of millions of dollars. 
hotel booking company across Europe and the UK and, and Asia as well. Yeah, what would I have done differently? I mean, that just that obsessive focus on customer needs really is number one. What absolutely do our customers need? And that's not only, because again, they're a marketplace. It's not only the customers themselves, but also the hotels at the same time. And back then they had quite an antagonistic, and don't get me wrong, there's still a lot of that, an antagonistic relationship with their hotels. And so if I was going to tackle that problem today, I was going to compete with booking.com, I would start to build extremely strong relationships with hotels. If you can build a strong relationship with a hotel and you've got supply, the market will follow. Okay. And equally with any marketplace, I would do that, but I would have a rigorous focus on matching both sides of that marketplace. Cause at the moment it's balanced too differently. So absolutely customers and their needs. It's classic stuff. And often at this point, it feels like a cliche to just to say that you should do that. But often what's interesting about decision-making is why people don't do things based on user need, why they don't do that sort of stuff. And that for me is more interesting than why, because everybody knows you should. But what's more interesting is why don't organizations do stuff around users and what they need? Yeah, that's exactly it. The thing is, we've been talking about this concept of doing your customer discovery and asking the right questions for years and years, and individuals get it. You talk to any individual and they're like, yeah, totally, I, I can do this. But when you look at organizations, that company failed back then, but there's still companies failing today for the exact same reasons, because you have people in the company who are making bad assumptions and there are other people in the company who may or may not spot these patterns, but aren't empowered to call it out, aren't able to say, hey, should we go back and do something about this? And what they actually need are the, the tactical, practical things that they can do to call it out and do something about it so that they don't end up, you know, with some story like you 10 years later going, yeah, company went kaput and we sold it all for pennies. Well, I've got lots of those stories of bad decisions and failures. I've got lots of them and they're not shared much in our world, but I've got a lot of them and a lot of them share some very similar themes in that they don't have that. So I talk about, I have this concept of, I call it the decision diamond and it's, it's based around Henry. I couldn't even pronounce his surname, Henry from, he works at Minecraft now and he was at Spotify for a while. He, he had this concept of how decisions are made. He had a triangle, Henrik Kinberg. Thank you, Anna. That's exactly who it's going to be. Yeah. Anyway, there's four points to this diamond. Let me talk about it. One of those is user research and user insight discovery, classic qualitative user research. It's on one point of that. And there are three other points. The other one is, is of course, data. Data's key. Really, if you understand what's going on at scale on your product, that's really important to know. So you've got these two elements of decision-making. And there are two more. One of them is obviously business drivers. It's something... If there's a business need, there's a business opportunity, if something's going wrong in a particular business area, you've got some focus through a business lens to go, we should be doing more of this or we should be doing less of this. There's business as well. And the fourth one, which is often, I think, overused or underused, if anybody can guess what it might be, is you've got, you have business, you have user research, you have data. And the fourth one, which I think is over, often over-focused on in some organizations and under-focused on the other ones is instinct or gut feel. And to make a good decision, you need data points from all four of those things. So often what can happen in organizations that make bad choices is they might come in an instinct or gut feel. Boss says we have to do X right now or competitor Y has just launched this. We've got to do it. That is just instinct. That feels like something we should do. What you need to do as a product manager is stop and go, okay, great. What other points have you got on the decision diamond to make and support that choice? Have you got any user research data to prove that this is something that people want? Have you got any anecdotal stuff from user discovery or interviews to understand that this is something people need? Is there a business case for us doing that? And you look at that decision diamond and go, okay, great. We've got one point on there. We need two. And if, if you've got two points on the diamond, okay, it's probably an okay decision. If you've got three points on the diamond, like you've got data, you've got user research, and you've got business, great. It's probably assuming you should do, definitely do. If all four are there, gut feel, user data, user research, and business, get on it. But that's the point to leap onto it. And what this tool is really great for is not only doing that, it's making it obvious something you should do by pushing you forward because you've got four points, but stopping those elements where you've just got one point on that decision, just one piece of data. So I speak, I've spoken a lot, worked a lot with Google over the years. Google are heavily data-driven and typically they would just react to data. And that's great. And that can get you a certain way through, but it's not going to be a completely solid decision if you don't. In fact, I speak to, in the podcast, a very senior user researcher at Google who's trying to empower managers and product managers with the right information to make better choices. But again, 
often these things can come from just one data point. And if one point on that decision diamond, if they come from one point, probably not a good place to start. You need to go and get more information before you jump into that decision and that choice. Yeah, I love that. That actually um, echoes some of the things that I've thought about in terms of you see companies going out there and say, oh, we're data driven. And you go, is data driven the thing that you really want to be? You want to be data informed. Are you customer driven? You don't want to be customer driven. You don't want to just build things because your customers say so. You don't want to be customer informed. And so I like that because it splits it out into the other things that you're actually considering, the business side as well as the gut feel side, because some of our job really is just listening to our gut. And it does sound a little bit unscientific, but keep in mind that there is something that when it comes to our gut, it is driven by the multitude of decisions that we are making when we actually get to that point. Uncountable number of things that you can't just quantify and say, this one times this one equals this decision. There's a reason why product managers are not going to be replaced by AI anytime soon. It still requires humans to make the, the final calls and say, this is actually the right decision. I can see this far ahead and here's where we need to go. And I think it fits back into the kind of management style as well. So I, in one of the podcasts, I interviewed Jeff Gotthelf as well, the author of Sense and Respond and Lean UX. And we talk in that podcast a lot about how senior managers struggle with managing the, the uncertainty of product teams, the uncertainty of, yeah, we're going to run a few sprints and some stuff's going to come out at the end of it, where senior managers have been taught for so many years in business programs and throughout the kind of 70s, 80s, 90s, and early 2000s to have the answers, to be able to tell everybody what they should be doing right now. I'm not a good boss if I can't tell my team what they should be working on now. And that is some behavior that needs to be absolutely unlearned from bosses is they can't go around saying, I know exactly what we should do. And that's gut feel often for a lot of them. And they don't have the ability to adequately make good decisions because they don't have the same access to the data and the user research and discovery that product teams have. So what's great about the decision diamonds, it can work really well when as you as a product manager, you sketch it out on that mural or whiteboard or whatever it is to the boss, you give them that tool to help them make better choices. Okay. It's not just about you. It's also about empowering the layers above you in senior management to make better choices and not because somebody has a good idea, like a gut feel instinct idea from senior management, you've got to support that and work towards that, but you've got to give them the tools to understand that they've not got the full picture of what's going on. And that can work. If you sketch this tool, you could just use it back with those folks as well, which is great. And your success as a product manager when you see your thinking being taken and used by the CEO when they're doing a presentation on something as well. That's the strength of this, is it can flow through the organization. I love this. This is actually one of the things I'm really passionate about is that product management isn't something just done by the product managers. Product managers are the ones who shepherd in a good process for good product management. Yeah. They're not the ones with all the right answers themselves, right? It's not your job to have the answers. It's your job to ask the best questions. And the best thing a product manager should do is help people in their team come to the right answers by giving them the tools, giving them the same tools that they would use to come to those decisions. So they're not, they're not sitting there constantly just with this pile of ideas and suggestions on their shoulders and trying to weigh them up themselves. If your execs, if your team members can all look at the same framework and say, well, actually, this is how Jana would break it down. Therefore, we're going to put this idea forward and we think this one's strong. That takes so much weight off you as a product manager and just empowers your team to make better decisions across the board. Yeah. And, and you know what? The other thing is I often these days I get called in to help with product vision or product strategy. And often when you come into somebody come, ask me to come in to help with that, the number one cause of the product strategy being not being in place, not being strong is because the business strategy isn't strong. There isn't a strong business vision or corporate vision for what your organization should be doing. And so it's very hard to create a product vision or strategy because that's not there above you. And so what I'm finding myself doing a lot more these days, and this is, hey, career advice for all of you product folks, is the skills you've got, as Yana quite rightly said, right now are going to set you up so well for that point when you're the CEO and you need to come up with a business strategy or a strategy for the company. Oh, hold on a minute. I've got the skills to be able to do this. This is the same thing, a product strategy. Hey, it's a dirty secret. A product strategy is a business strategy. A business strategy is a product. They don't have to be separate things. The two should flow from each other. Because again, the majority of businesses we're working on these days are heavily tech focused and product focused. The two should be the same. So 
anything you're good at as product managers is going to carry you forward into your future career when you know, you're creating that business strategy. So yeah, every time I get called in for a product strategy, first question I ask is, where's your business strategy? Oh, we haven't got one. All right. Okay. There's the problem. <laughs> let's sort yeah. that out and then point me at your boss. Let's go and chat to the CEO and let's fix this. And then once the business strategy is done, product strategy is straightforward. Yeah, that's perfect. And that's such good advice because that's the type of thing that can really help lift somebody up in their career if they're able to identify problems that their exec team has and how they can solve that. I always recommend to people when they are joining a company or rethinking their role within a business as a product manager, but your job is often to think about what problem your product solves for the customers, but also think about what problem you solve for your business. When they wrote that job ad, they were articulating a problem that they had, and you have a particular skill set and you can solve unique problems for them. How can you solve those problems? And if you are spotting that they have problems articulating their vision and their business strategy, you can help them with that because the same things that go into product management are the same things that go into organizational design and business decisions, really. Yeah. It's all, all the same stuff all the way down, to be honest. I've got a great story, actually. I'm, I'm yeah. publishing a video on it next week. I've been working recently with a senior director of strategy, big multi-million dollar global business, director of strategy. Joe, we haven't got a strategy. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Director of strategy, been in your job for a year now. Why not? We don't need a strategy. I'm like, you don't need a strategy? Oh, no, we don't need a strategy. Uh, we haven't got a strategy because we don't need a strategy. And I'm like, okay, so what's that? And I was like, why? Is that what well, strategy is obvious? And you're like, okay, this is this is <laughs> warning signs, klaxons going off in my head right here. Is that often what you can see in organizations that make bad decisions is they are lacking in senior level strategic thinking. And it's really interesting. That seems to be the biggest issue that I'm facing at the moment is a lot of organizations are growing rapidly, especially in this kind of world post COVID and lockdown where the world is, is completely different. And certainly a lot of the tech businesses I'm working with, they're like absolutely supercharged by the changes, societal changes that are here and they're growing out of control and they don't feel like they need a strategy to cope with that. And it's like bad decisions are happening everywhere. And the business is great despite the bad decisions. And what's interesting about that is that growth is not, it's not matching market growth. They're growing, but they're not matching market growth. And, and so there's lots of sets of challenges around ultra fast growth in any organization. And it's, again, I spend a lot of my time working with companies that are growing about how, and why they need a strategy and why their strategies could help them grow responsibly and in that kind of way. Because again, what happens when companies are growing super fast with such a high velocity is the person that struggles the most is the product manager because they've got so much pressure to build and to create and build things, but there's no business strategy for them to be able to base their product decisions around. Other than we're going to grow fast. We need to build all of these 200 things. Here's some great ideas that we brainstormed last week. Just keep building. And there's lack of business strategy in a high growth company is the most dangerous place to be. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting times we're in. Yeah, absolutely. You see so many companies who, as you said, like companies who are succeeding even though they don't have a strategy you actually see a lot of companies out there who hit on something quite luckily right they just have something that drives them forward and they strike gold they strike gold for a little while and they don't actually learn discipline the processes and every company goes through that whole thing of growth and maturity and then decline. It's just a matter of when, and you can chart it out with every company. And so these companies that are doing this, right? Sometimes that's a huge thing upwards and sometimes it's a tiny one upwards, but I've been in companies that have been on this huge ride upwards and I could see it slowing down. And I was like, hold on a second. This company has no discipline. This company, I don't understand how this company makes money. This is all going to dry up. And it did. <laughs> and you hear it, you hear about it. People talk about, oh yeah, we're surfing the wave. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're skiing in front of the avalanche is what you're doing. Is that thing's coming for you? And you've got the appointment that's there. And when I worked with Trainline in 2010, I can tell the story because it's 11 years ago. Trainline were like that. They had enormous rapid UK growth, right? No strategy, nothing, no real idea other than we're going to build something that people can buy train tickets from. And they had an enormous growth because the internet was growing. They were on that wave. 2010 here, two competitors got, came along and then suddenly they realized, holy moly, this is not going to last. We need some serious strategic thinking about not only our business direction, but also our product direction at the same time. In 2010 here, and we, yeah, 
the iteration then was great because it met customer needs and all of those things, but it was a real watershed for them. If they'd not got that right, they would have been overtaken. The train line wouldn't be in the same way that it is today in the UK. So I've absolutely seen it at that sort of scale on both sides of it, really. That's interesting. This is one of the reasons why I'm always telling companies, no matter how small you are, no matter how successful you are, whatever's happening, always be looking for ways to disrupt yourself. Because as you grow, other companies are going to be seeing that tasty market share, that tasty revenue. Every time you get a new customer, a new logo, a new press release, a new company is going to be up and coming and looking at you going, Ooh, we could build that for half the time and build only the good features, only the parts that we want to, that you've already validated. And people are going to be nipping at your heels. And so you might feel like you are absolutely riding that way of doing great. Um, but in reality, there are going to be other companies doing it for faster and cheaper than you. And anything that was a competitive barrier before is becoming less of a competitive barrier, right? Product is no longer a competitive differentiation. And so you should always be thinking of ways to disrupt yourself, carve out time for R&D, carve out time to think about if we were to be that startup that was disrupting us, what would we build and build it before the startup does so that you can disrupt yourself and be the one, you've got that one swoop that you're on be the next swoops that we can take that next ride. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm t- yeah. Cause and you see the other thing with these high growth companies as well, the other symptom they face, we talked too much before about organizations that are too focused on the competition. Often in that growth phase, they are not focused enough on their competition is they dismiss other people. Like they dismiss the other startup and snipping at their heels. When I was working at Marriott, again, I'm out of NDA for that one. When I was working at Marriott in the US, they dismissed booking.com all the time. Oh no, they don't know what they're doing. They're just a small Dutch company. They know nothing about this stuff. We're Marriott. We know hotels. And I remember being so many conversations where they just dismissed booking.com out of hand. And now a huge volume of their sales come through booking.com and they just didn't see it coming because they just dismissed them out of hand. Nokia famously dismissed Apple iPhone out of hand. Blackberry the same. There's a lot of history of that. Blockbuster, Netflix. There's lots of these organizations that have done that where they've not, growth has happened. They're very successful and they're doing extremely well, but they're not keeping enough of an eye on the competition. It's all of these things are a balancing act, really. Yeah, absolutely. Joe, we've been talking about some bad decisions and things like that, but what are some good inputs for decisions? What should product managers consider before they're making decisions? Yeah, good point. I mentioned the decision time and the things and the inputs take into it as well. I think one of the most missing biz aspects of, and this comes from the development and deployment teams generally, is not enough understanding of how the business measures and defines value. So what does, and how does a business, your business design define value? That's typically most commercial organizations, that's money, obviously. But if you're in other organizations, there's always something that your business values and, and measures its values against. It's truly and thoroughly understanding what those values are. Now there's tools like OKRs that can help you to get there, but it's less about the tool. It's more about the mindset of getting there. If you as a product manager should be 100% focused on how your business defines and delivers value. And that I think is the missing link in terms of really supercharging your work. So again, I mentioned that a lot of what I do is supercharge teams to really deliver results. And that's around delivering stuff that is not, it's not rocket science. It's all about delivering the value to the business that's there. And that's got to match with what the customers want, but absolutely rigorous focus on delivering business value on everything you do is I think honestly, the missing link still these days. It's, and I see it much more in organizations like large banks is a good example where they'll have a development organization that they treat as an internal agency where they all tell that agency what to do. Hey, dear internal bank tech team, can you build us this app that allows people to apply for mortgages? And the tech team will like, okay, we'll build that for you. Off we go and we will go and throw it into our process and off we'll, something will get shut out of the back of it in 18 months. Is those organizations and those tech teams are not being proactive enough to tell the business what they need to be doing next in terms of Here's tech, here's what you should be doing next business. We're not your internal agency building what you tell us to build. We are here with you to help tell you what we think the business should be building based on this user value. We can make more money, 10 times more money if we did do this thing. And having the confidence to go into a meeting, make 10 times more money if we do this thing, rather than being a service-led operation within an organization, which product teams can become if they're not careful. This is something that jives very much with the conversation we had with Jeff Patton here on the Product Experts webinar. He was talking about some of the problems that you have within businesses 
that stemmed from early the Agile Manifesto, where when we talk about the customer in the Agile Manifesto, what we're actually talking about is the tech team treating the rest of the business as their customer. And where that causes a problem is that you've got this team whose out, outcome is to just deliver what it is, whatever it is that they asked for. So if it is build an app that does this thing, all they have to do is build the app that does this thing. They're not actually tied to the outcome, which is we're here to make money or to change our world in this particular way. And so it's, like you say, about getting the understanding the value for the business, but making sure that, that is spread amongst the team. It's understood across the team so that everyone is bought into it. You know, anybody at any level in their career, the number one way to supercharge your career is by understanding how your business measures value and talking to that all the time. That is what gets you forward no matter what. Okay. That is the number one thing. In my experience, I do, I work with a lot of, I mentioned I supercharge kind of leaders. 50% of what I do is we work on the thing, the product, the process, the stuff like that. The other 50% I do work on with product managers is giving them the confidence to stand up in a meeting and go, no, we should be doing this because it's going to generate X amount of value add to this business. Being very confident in that ability for them to do that. So the tail is not wagging the dog in quite that same way. Is you are confidently as a product manager standing up in that meeting and being, no, we're going to build this for this reason, for this money. And that is often a lot of product managers getting out of their own way. Let me say this agile manifesto, all of these kind of agile frameworks, I've not even mentioned safe, but all of these things can get in the way of you being great at your job, which is all about you as a product manager, knowing how your organization measures and delivers value and just doing that, talking to that in all aspects of your job. You do that and you're going to go far. Absolutely. We've got some questions coming in from the audience now. I like this one from Andy, short and sweet. He said, what's the biggest thing that you used to think about making good decisions that you no longer think is the case? Hey, that's, a, that's such a great question. I thought that it was process. I thought organizations had like a decision-making process. Like on the executive chief operating officers, there was the decision-making process that they went through, like boxes and arrows. First we do this, then we do this, then we do this, then we do this. I thought it was a process. And I now know it's not, it's a state of mind and a state of being and a state of culture is the best way to make decisions. Everybody wants it to be a process. Everybody's asking me for what the best decision-making process is. That's the problem. And a, a symptom of that is people asking me, I need a product prioritization framework, please. Anybody ask you, if you think you need a product prioritization framework, warning, something is wrong somewhere else in your organization that means that you need that to make better choices. It's not about that. So yeah, the biggest thing for me was I thought there would be a secret process and there's not. Excellent. I love that. And thank you for saying that because I've heard that before. We need a decision-making process and something in me just freezes and I wasn't able to put my finger on why, but, but you're right. It is more of a, a mindset. It's um, about understanding how and why we're making these decisions and how it's framed back to what we're actually trying to achieve, but yeah, yeah. not, not this tight process. That means that we're going through this flow diagram before we make any decisions. Okay. So um, we don't want that. Yeah. One of my most interesting interviews was with Instagram. So one of the leaders of the Reels program at Instagram, and I asked him about this and Instagram was, it, this is my favorite podcast. I've just put it in the chat, go and listen to it after this. Tin is a great wonderful human being uh, Instagram and anyway they talk it's all in the culture then what's interesting about how he talks about his team making processes they talk about jobs to be done they talk about rocks and pebbles and sand if you've used that one they talk about bets they talk about lots of these frameworks to help you make decisions but what's interesting about them is they take the best bits of all of them and they make them their own and so what's interesting is again I saw this as a big trend is that they take all these organizations take the best bits and they create their own way of talking about decision making Okay. Take the best bits of thinking in bets. They take the best bits of, which is again, some of the stuff that, that Spotify use. They take the rocks, sand, and pebbles, which is something that PayPal have famously talked about as well. I've got links to all of this stuff as well. I've on my blog, I can share all this with you. Jobs to be done, which is obviously something I talk about as well. But they take all of these processes and just take the best bits and make their own way of doing it. And what's interesting about Instagram is the teams are encouraged to make their own ways and processes of working on certain things. HelloFresh do similar things as well. So there's lots of organizations who design and create their own approaches to making decisions. Okay. And that's the best way is you just take the best bits of all of them and make something that's your own. 
Excellent. So there's another question in here from Colin, and it's just reflecting back on something we were talking about uh, just a little bit prior. And he said, uh, funnily enough, we've been having this conversation at work. He says, a large UK government department just today about the importance of really having a good high level view of our products and a clear pathway to how this breaks down into low level features. Mm. How do you recommend we put together and document this pathway? Yeah. So I'm going to be truly honest with you, Colin. There's a lot if so anybody knows this, in the UK, the government, working for the government is the, there's so much government work available at the moment. In the UK and the US, I think it's the same way. I don't do government work. And I've done a lot in the past. And the thing that I struggle with governmental organizations is they don't have a clear, and I talked about this earlier on, how they measure value and success in that government department. And that's what makes all of this stuff really acute in those areas is how does your department measure success? and deliver value. And that's ultimately where you talk about products and clear pathways is you need to define and understand truly how your department measures success and delivers value. What are those two things? And that will give you that clear pathway. If you don't have those things, or those things aren't abundantly clear to everybody in the room, especially the senior decision makers who don't want to address the fact that I mean, part of that's keeping ministers happy, part of that's political, part of that's based on consumers, whatever those things might be, you need to map that out. And once you have that, decisions are easy to make. Okay. That's the challenge in working in, in government is that that stuff's not always clear. People don't like to talk about it. And that's always been my weakness with working in government is I ask for that and I push for that. And that doesn't always exist. So I've been, that's the right word. Yeah, I have been by a number of uh, folk. A lot of my friends have, have worked, been through the government digital service in the UK and I've worked with a few of them, but I'm not the right person for that because I ask those difficult questions and those difficult questions don't, aren't always answerable. I know that doesn't answer your question, Colin, but I would look for you to map success and value and then it will flow from that. Excellent. Excellent. This actually reflects like a conversation I was having with a fellow product friend of mine who works in a, uh, a UK government area. We we're talking about how they, they lacked discipline. And this is in, in regards to the uh, expend, the expenditure government agencies often don't have the same constraints on spending that public companies do. So having been in startups, what, what a contractor costs, what a, a freelancer costs, what an in-house person costs, and how long something is going to take and how much it costs. And oftentimes they don't see how much money and how much time is going to go into something and therefore don't reel it back. And therefore things just run on and on because they don't have the discipline. And that's why they often they hire these really expensive management consultancies or service companies like Capita or Serco or Accenture or any of those groups. They bring those guys in because they expect those guys to bring it. But those guys don't come in. They come in with clever contracts and smart ways of working. That means that they don't have that accountability either. And it's a real struggle to get that because again, nobody's measuring what success is or value or setting goals for that stuff. It's starting to change. Don't get me wrong. And it really is starting to change, but it's a slow process to get there. And I have my issues with the large management consultancies, especially in the world of product and business strategy and tech strategy, especially because they don't really don't under truly understand what they're doing for that yeah. blanket <laughs> statement there. So feel free to disagree with me. Um, yeah, it's, it's a real challenge in government, Colin. So I absolutely feel your pain. If you want to reach out and have a, a therapy session, I'm here to chat to you about it, my friend. That's, that's wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I recognize your name. Anyway. <laughs> Let's have other, other questions. <laughs> Excellent. Colin did actually mention something about uh, documenting stuff. And I, like, that, that brings a question to my mind, which is, how do you think about documenting decisions? Good question. I've been writing about this in the book at the moment. The ways I've seen this being done is I really love the way Amazon do it with, they do things up, they write, they write the press release for the thing that they're building and designing and doing it. And that's often a great way to do it because that uncovers a lot of what you're working on. I really like that way of doing it as well. Other people do things like they'll do a uh, pre-postmortem or they'll do a postmortem. So all the things that can go wrong in that decision-making, there's lots of ways you can start documenting it by pushing yourself forward. And is it called a pre-mortem? I think it is a pre-mortem of what, what could go wrong and documenting that stuff as well. But I really like the way Amazon do it. It's such a lightweight way of just doing that press release of what it can look like and how it can work. But yeah, again, other things, decision diamond's great for that as well, because that gives you accountability again. Oh, we've done, oh, you've got all of those four things. Great. Wonderful, you're going to work really well. So the decision diamond can help also with writing those documents, but honestly, make them as visual as possible because senior folks don't read them and make them as pithy and as well-written as you possibly can, like the way that Amazon do it with their 
press release that they write before they design and create something. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Matt. Amanda asked a question and she said, what are some good examples for strategy when the biggest pain point for the company is the cost of running a legacy platform? So all the efforts are for creating a new platform to transition to the existing features. Yeah, I've been here with this a couple of times, actually. I worked with the startup that just gone retiring their legacy platform for something new. It depends really where, what state you're in, in terms of that stuff. If it's a brand new platform based on, so again, this is more of a technical issue, I think, than probably a product thing. And I don't know what your technical strategy is for replacing that existing product, that legacy platform. If it's a swapping in of one for another, that's dangerous. So again, having worked on large legacy products that work, the best approach is often, and this is getting technical, is using and developing things called microservices, which are based around individual features. So you build a microservice of one feature that plugs into your existing legacy platform and you do it that way and you keep plugging in and cutting it off. So you're not boiling the ocean, you're cutting that thing up into smaller pieces, replacing small bits of functionality as you go. Because again, that minimizes risk in terms of dependencies. It's going to work. So you're not like on Friday turning one off and Monday turning the new one on. It's small microservices to do it. So I'd imagine, Amanda, if you're asking me this, that perhaps your tech strategy is the one that's weak here, not the product one. I don't know if that's true, but it makes it harder for you as a product manager if you're waiting for six months for the new one to be released and you can't build anything on the old one because the old one's out of date and you don't want to put any sunk cost already into the old one. You want to spend all your developer resources for the new one. The symptoms there, if you recognize those symptoms that nobody wants to do any work on the old one, you're saving all your good stuff for the new one and you're not going to ship anything for 18 months, get in touch. We can chat about it. But Amanda, I think, yeah, that's probably a tech strategy issue there, I would imagine. I, I would echo that, which is this uh, idea around rethinking the refactor. A lot of people think when they've got a refactor, they've just got to take the old product and rebuild all the functionality and relaunch it as it was. But... Mm -hmm. Rethink that. What you should be doing is take, imagine that you were a startup coming in and disrupting you, the original existing company in that space. Which features would you build first? Would you build that feature here? Would you build that feature there? Go and build those one pieces. As Joe said, like a microservice or whatever it is, a small piece of that. And just prove that you can build a nice new version of it with nice new tech yeah. uh, and get a few people moving over to that new beta thing. And of course, it won't do everything. If they still want to configure stuff and do all, their, all the, the other stuff, they need to go back to the, the full app. You can reduce the dependency on your one product versus the other one. And so over time, you move people off the one to the other, as eventually you can make your other one deprecated all while building up your other one. And what then happens, you might actually find that you don't have to rebuild the entire app as it was in the first place. The chances that you rebuild the entire app as it was in the first place is actually really slim. If you've got any questions, just get in touch. Any of the things you've seen today, you're like struggling, shout, I'm here. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you so much for your time here today. And thank you everybody for your questions. If you have other questions, feel free to reach out to Joe directly or to us, and we'll absolutely um, take the time to uh, make sure that those get to Joe. And in the meantime, this has been recorded. It's going to be up on our uh, YouTube channel, and uh, we'll hear from us soon. It's wonderful. Thank you. It's been wonderful. <laughs> more of your amazing questions. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. Bye.